I know you don't know, you don't need the words today. So in the back, we've got some, uh, some pictures in place of the words. An amazing week, guys. An amazing uh, season for Pass and Play. You know, every, every time we do Pass and Play, we invite people to come and see something that, that we don't have. You guys know that? What I said just now, I know it might not make a lot of sense, but it's really important. We always invite people to come and see something we don't have. If you waited until you had everything ready to go to invite them, it'd be too late. So four or five weeks before we start Passion Play, we, we begin to invite them to come and see it, knowing that we're not ready, knowing that there's no way we could tell the story. Even if you came on Monday of this last week to see the Passion Play, there were so many things that were just not ready. We got ready in front of folks on Monday. But Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, wow, what a week. The thing that uh, I think makes your hair turn white is when other people invite people to see things that you don't have. So like uh, Pastor Tom invited a lady from Albuquerque to come and see Passion Play this year. Come and see something we don't have. Crystal, was that her name? Krista. And then there was Pastor Jonathan who was who was out and uh, inviting pastors from Nicaragua to come and see something we didn't have. They came. Then there was Farid who said, let's go to Egypt and let's invite some people to come and see what we don't have. Just sing a song. There is a point there, but I'm not going to get it in right now. Not going to happen. In Venezuela, another brother joined us, inviting people to see something we didn't have. Don't know if you'll hear this or not, but I'll say it. Last week, 1,127 people came to know Christ in Venezuela, seeing the presentation that's behind us. I won't rerun that for you today, but a lot happened this week, guys. It was an amazing week, and I thank you guys for, uh, for being part of it. Try this together with us this morning. Love this song. Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, and all the earth rejoices, all the earth rejoices.
is our God. The world will see how great, how great is our God. stand with us this morning. Let's sing one or two together today. Grandpa Stan. It's got a good ring. Thinking. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you worry for loving so So 
I know you guys are busy hugging. You're missing a whole song here. Two verses left. That's all we got. I'm inviting you back. Sing this with me this morning. Here we go. When the bridegroom comes, the robes be white. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will you so be ready for the mansion? Right on, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? In the soul and the blood. Can have a seat this morning. Uh oh, she's all tied up. She's all tied up. <laughs> yeah, now and then we'll take a couple songs and put them together. I just tested you this morning to see if you could out hug a whole song. Uh, give yourselves a hand. You guys, you did it. You out hugged a whole song. I got to tell you, we, um, when we first came down to Farmington and Pastor had called and, and said, would you, would you consider coming? And I, you've heard the story. I said, we'll pray about it. And we really were praying. But man, when we walked in here and we found the family that we have here, this is an amazing family. Chuck, huh? Amazing family. My only struggle right now is, you know, Linda is struggling with this whole idea of September 15th. I shared that with you. And if she uses Sunday morning to continue showing pictures of the grandbaby, <laughs> just hang on. We might have to do a, a whole series of songs. I don't know how we'll get through them. Pat, you got this meant. Can you help me with something? Pat, Pat, can you help, help me with something? Come up here real quick. I want to want to share something with you guys today. Pat, Pat's our model. He's, he's wearing the new, the new uh, Passion Play shirt. Well, I, I got to... We didn't work on that, Pat and I. We didn't work on that at all. But I thought it was important for you to see. And Pastor invited you. I, I want to invite you too. The 21st of April, next door, we're going to have a follow-up. 
And guys, at that meeting, what we do, we, we, we come back together for the cast and crew, and here's all these 40-plus churches that have partnered with us now in our community to not only share the story locally, but model it globally. And, and it continues to grow. <laughs> so will you come? On the 21st, will you come? Because we're going to celebrate what God did here over, over this past week and look forward. Linda said this on the way to church, and I just wanted to not hear it. But she said, it's, it's not over. It just began for these new communities. Do you know, we're looking at the pictures today. When we, when we stepped into the last week, we had 27 host communities around the world. Barquisi Meto was 28. Pastor Tom, they, they did something. No, listen, yeah, that's, that's good. We never went to Venezuela. And when you think that they did it in six weeks, and we did it in six weeks, yes, we did it in six weeks here, but, but we moved here. <laughs> we moved here. And we called our friends from Denver, and we called our friends from Vegas to come and help us. Nobody went to help in Barquisimeto. Those precious brothers and sisters, they did it all by themselves. And they did it watching a video, video clips that Pastor Tom shared with Pastor Guzman. That's all. That's all they had. You know what? That gives me a lot of hope. <laughs> that somebody could catch the vision, just, just seeing a script, seeing a few slides, that kind of thing. The other night while we were on the platform, Pastor mentioned this, in Nicaragua on, um, in, de, in the month of December, they're getting ready to share their, their presentation. But they signed the agreement to produce a week ago on Palm Sunday down here at the, at the convention center. That became city number 29. And then on Good Friday, some of you were there, our brother Victor, who was here with us last Sunday, signed another agreement to produce. That is number 30. City number 30. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And when I, I think back 20, 20 years ago, Farmington was number three. Red, that's a big deal. I wasn't expecting this the other night when we, when we were signing that agreement to produce. I wasn't expecting this. But at the close of the signing of that agreement to produce, we were praying for Victor and for all of those that were on that side. And he brought a gift for us, not for me, for us. So I brought it to church with me this morning to give it to you. This is the gift he gave, his personal Bible. That's, a, that's an Arabic Bible. And here's what he left it for. And I'm showing you the shirt that Pat's wearing today. It's an abbreviated message that's contained in this book. I hope you might take a minute today before you leave just to hold this. It's the weirdest thing because it doesn't open like this. It opens like this. They start from this side and they read from right to left. Come take a look. And, and can we to get, the reason he left this, he said, would you pray? Because we're translating right now the script into Arabic. Will you pray for the folks? I'm going to leave it right here in the front. I hope you take just a minute. Maybe together we could pray for the work that was just started this week. Not the work, the work that was completed. <laughs> for the work that was just begun. Wow. Where, where are we going together, guys? <laughs> where are we going? God just continues to to lay it open in front of us. Try this song with me this morning. Lots to thank him for. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to pray wonders of your mind. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I have, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, O the earth, let us sing. 
Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, the song is so true. Nothing, nothing this world has even begins to compare to the joy, to the, to the life that we find in you. Lord, we have so much to celebrate here today. As we shared the story this past week, and Lord, as we heard the testimonies of those who came in Barquisimeto, as we heard about the, the stories right here, kids from Aztec High School who are still healing from the ordeal that they've been through this year and the shooting there, God, and the, and the healing you were bringing in their lives right here around our, our altars this week. Lord, for a little grandma who came, 78 years old, just came to, to have her son stop inviting her. And Lord, as she came face to face with the cross, Lord, her life was changed and gave her heart to you this week. God, we celebrate all of those things. We celebrate all of those. And Lord, we look forward to what you have for us right here this morning. How would you mold us and shape us here today? Lord, as tired as we are and as, as going as we've been this week, Lord, yet this morning you have new life for us in the words that our pastor will share with us today. Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for the hope that we can take from where we sit here this morning to the world where we're going this week. Direct our steps, Lord. Guide our path. Use us for your glory this week, and we'll be so careful to thank you for it. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand just one more time this morning. Just one more time. This is an old, old song, but it's a great one, and I love the words. You can't sing this one sitting down. It goes like this. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love. He laughed. Forgive, he bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my 
can have a seat. Taking some of your water. It's about six degrees hotter for me than I like, so I start coughing. There's a lot of garbage floating around. Too. No, it's called hot air. We want to look at the resurrection today. Hope you got notes as you came in. Obviously, last week we did not do Palm Sunday. Yeah, anytime you're warm, take your extra jacket off, okay? And then when you... Well, it always does that to you. We'll keep having that conversation. As we're getting settled in, getting our kids shuffled around, moved a little bit, I want to not totally ignore last week because it leads right into this week. So let me say it this way. Last week, what you would have taken notes on is Hosanna. Here's what you need to know about Hosanna. Somebody know what it means. That's what I want to tell you. Okay, let's change the voice. I'm going to, I'm going to tinker with you for a second. It's emphatic. Does everybody understand emphatic? You crank the volume up. Here's what it says. It's begging, God, please save us now. Barquisimeto, Hosanna, God, please save us now. Our country's gone off the cliff politically. Financially, we're a total wreck. We know that the only way out is through blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's Palm Sunday. Okay? So the reason that's important is because the, the, the adult population, were they saying Hosanna? Did they start this whole thing? The children began to cry out, Hosanna. God, please save us now. And what did the adults say? Be quiet. What did Jesus say? If they're quiet, the rocks will start crying out. Here's the point, folks. Until we get, he is risen means nothing until you get to a point of desperation, of knowing that God needs to save you, that you have a problem. This is missing all too often in our presentation of invitations. We just want to come and pray the prayer. Okay, I don't want to totally rag on that, but you know where I stand on it. God loves a broken and contrite heart. That he honors. A proud heart that cannot say Hosanna, he will oppose. And they can't come to Christ. So until we find ourselves with Palm Sunday, desperation of needing a Messiah, a Savior, one to redeem us from our sin and ourselves, Easter truly means nothing because that's the solution. That's the proof that God hears the prayers of his people. God, please save us now. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He went to the cross. He became our sin. He didn't just carry it. He became our sin. He's not just the Son of God. That's an identifier. He is God in the flesh, incarnate, who took on the creation to save his creature, us. Holy God became the sinful man, Jesus, on the cross and was rejected. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we might be made his righteousness. What do we have to do? We have to cry out, Hosanna, please, God, save me now. Let's look at Luke 24, 5. <clears throat> and while their faces were bent down to the earth in fear, these said to them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? These are the women who went to finish the task they had begun before and was interrupted by the Sabbath. And they were going to finish the ritual cleansing and wrapping of the body and taking care of the body for death. 
and uh, they showed up, and something was wrong. The stone had been rolled away. The grave was empty. Don't get confused in the one angel, the two. This is perspective. One saw a gardener. Don't get confused on that. Basically, God sends messengers to tell us what we need to know if we're not able to hear it plainly. Because didn't Jesus tell them? The Son of Man will be taken by men, evil men, sinful men, and killed. And on the third day, he will raise he will be raised from the dead. Wasn't he clear on that? Here's what I find. Usually we don't hear the first time. Rarely do we even hear the second or third time. We usually have to hear something even all the way up to seven times before we get it, apart from the visual. In this, Jesus had spoken what they needed to hear, and at the tomb they got the visual. Do you remember what I told you? Why are you looking for Jesus among the dead? He's not here. Let's see what Jesus has done. Again, you know my struggles with how we present stuff. That's where the Church of America is. <clears throat> we still are stuck in a double covenant theology. I don't want to get too involved in it yet. We'd love to do that. We do that a lot on Sunday mornings, Wednesday night, one-on-one, -on -one, whatever. Basically, the old covenant is obsolete. It has vanished. We just don't like that. So we want to go back and keep the commandments. We want to go back and pick this one because we think that's important. But we, we want to obey this one, but we don't care about that one. We're absolutely all over the map on this. And when Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, what is he referring to? Don't eat pork. Wash your hands before you eat. No, that would be mom. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in so doing, you have fulfilled all the law and the prophets. Gosh, isn't that easier? What is the command of God then that he insists that we do? And uh, Brother Victor and I went to the, to the Sanhedrin group to pray with them and walked in the door and they looked at me and said, well, give us a verse. Okay, Love one another. Here's another one. Would you love one another? Here's a third one. For crying out loud, can't you love one another? That's the command of God. Love one another. Did he say agree with one another did he say do all things exactly like everybody else does it no that's the false teaching today of unity that we lay down the doctrines of scripture that we all just become one hang out have some food usually and talk nice to each other and that's unity no it isn't that's hanging out together and eating food When we come to the understanding of who Christ is and what he has done, we will understand the new covenant. First piece there. Jesus in the resurrection has given us a new covenant. What did he do in that scene? And I'll update it one of these days. I just, you know, had a good picture. Covenant in my body and blood, which is broken for you, shed for you. He heals us of our transgressions and iniquities. That's what Isaiah is about. Not, not getting bronchitis or a cold or stomach flu or any of that. Okay, it's more than that. By his stripes we are healed of our infirmities and, his trans, and our transgressions. We need to know that. The new covenant is, is based upon something different. Let's look at this. Hebrews 8, 7 and 8. 12 and 13. <coughs> Excuse me. In Hebrews, it is an, it, it's um, a treatise of faith explaining what has happened. So ultimately, you read the whole book together. Romans is the other very, it's a very similar book. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second one. But God found something wrong in that first covenant, what does it say? With his people. That's the problem, us. 
not the law, not the covenant. We are the problem. We are the problem. Found something wrong with this people when he said, Look, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. I'm going to go into that in a second. I have to. I can't ignore it. For I will be merciful regarding their wrong deeds, and I will never again remember their sins. In speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete is aging and will soon disappear. It's, it's gone. Now, lest we get stuck with Israel and the house of Judah, we have to tie in Galatians and some other pieces in Hebrews. Who is the true Jew? The one who is circumcised of the flesh? No. The one who is circumcised of the heart. Okay, I'm going to dump a truck on you. Be ready. Today, the Jews in Israel don't need Jerusalem. They don't need a temple. They don't need any of that. They need Jesus. His kingdom is not of this world. The land doesn't matter. Let me say it again. The land doesn't matter. We call it the Holy Land because events historically took place there. We can go and see places where historic events, but don't get caught worshiping the place or the relic or the bones, or the history, or any of that. All of that is to point to Jesus saying, my kingdom is not of this world. It just isn't. I'm not looking for Jerusalem over across the country, which is pretty much similar to like San Juan County. I'm looking for a new city whose maker and builder is God. New heavens and new earth wherein dwell righteousness. I don't want to have just a remade model on the earth. I could care less about that. The new covenant makes all that possible. An eternal kingdom, a new heaven, a new earth, that's the focus of the new covenant. Who can be saved? Just the Jews? That's what they thought. No, now in Christ there is neither male or female, Greek or Jew, slave or free, for all are made one body in Christ. And yet we continue to split it up into two groups. Right? I heard that this last week. I just kind of shook my head. No, God says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you know what the best way to call upon the name of the Lord is? Hosanna, please save me now. And be broken before God. It's not just we pray a simple prayer. I get all of that. I understand that. I was raised with that. There has to be brokenness first. Or else there's nothing to be saved from. And if any of you don't know, there's a lot of non-Christians who are nicer people than we are sometimes. And better people than we are sometimes. It has nothing to do with it. The blood of Christ. The new covenant in my body and blood. That's what saves us. Now we're ready for the next one. Are you ready to write the next thing? The old covenant was not faultless. It depended upon keeping the law. And I love what Jesus did with the law in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, 7. If you say I didn't murder but you committed adultery, you're guilty of everything. If you keep all of the law, but you break just one little piece, you're guilty of everything. Are you getting the picture here? We're all guilty of everything. Some of us are just more outward about it. Okay? We're all broken beyond belief. So you can sit there and claim that I'm a basically decent person. I really can't argue that. There's a lot of people in this room a whole lot better than me. I, had, I know that for a fact. That has nothing to do with the new covenant. It's his one-sided covenant. Depending upon Jesus is the seed of Abraham. You've got to go to Galatians. Unto Abraham and his seed the promises were made. And the scripture saith, seed, not as seeds in many, but one seed, Christ. He's the seed. All who come to Christ are the seed. 
are his Israel, are his city of peace, Jerusalem. We are his new people. doesn't matter where you come from. He's thrown out gender, ethnicity, history, all of that. Whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. He who believes not is what? Condemned already. 17 says, but Jesus came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is not an exclusive club. It's whosoever will bow before the Lordship of Christ and to believe in, let me explain this, to believe in Jesus doesn't mean to believe about Jesus. A lot of people know about Jesus some of us were raised with a little children's Bible storybook next to our bed. We know the stories. It doesn't mean we know personally anything about it. The word used for belief is to entrust. Okay, why is that different from trust? I can say I trust you, but that's me responding and reacting to you. If I say entrust, I gave myself to you. Now whatever happens is up to you. Is that how you've given yourself to Jesus? You entrust him with your life, with your choices, with your decisions, with providing, with taking care of the problems, the stuff that we think we can never get past and God can never forgive. And he says, that's why you entrust me. I'm the Savior. I'm willing. I'm able. And I will save to the uttermost. I won't skip anything. I need to hear that over and over and over again. And I hope you do too. Because when we know that we can entrust our life to Jesus, that's biblical belief. Otherwise, you're just talking about Jesus. You're praying about Jesus. That's why I really struggle with a believer's prayer. The only believer's prayer I find in Scripture is the sinner and the Pharisee. And the one raised his head up to heaven. Oh, Lord. This is, this is the Jewish leader. Okay, Oh, Lord. Thank you for making me a Jew. Thank you that I'm not a woman. Thank you that I'm not like everybody else around me. I'm so blessed. Are you hearing some of the new theology out there today? Bless me, bless me, bless me. Here's the one who got saved. The other one would not get off his knees, would not look up to heaven, beat upon his breast, and cried out, and in effect, he said, Hosanna, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm not even worthy to look at you. I'm not worthy to talk to you. That's the prayer of salvation. I don't hear it anymore. Let's repeat after me. Let's all repeat. Okay, you're all saved. That's kind of like Benny Hinn, you know. You all fall all over the place, and now you're, you're good. The new covenant demands that we relinquish our rights upon ourself and trust ourselves to a Savior who died a cruel, planned, plotted murder, would not stay dead, and he bought us back. That's the message of salvation, not this other stuff. So it kind of baffles me when we do a two-hour play and then we go off into something else. You just saw Let's do something with it. What are you going to do? Are you going to submit yourself to Christ? You don't have to come submit to me. We almost make it hard, Stan. I get, you know I get frustrated with this. The first person in the audience, if this is the pastor, the first person in the audience is those double doors. What's wrong with that picture? What is wrong with that picture? And I'm under the spotlight and you're not. You have to come up here so everybody can see you and pray with me. Let me be unkind for a second. Only crazy people do that because it's not normal for anybody to get up in front of strangers with all the focus on them because all the focus should be on Christ. Why don't we go to them? We did do it in Shiprock one time. We got off the stage and we prayed with every person in the auditorium. A marriage was saved that night. Other people just cried, and they said, I have, I'm struggling. I'm a believer, but I'm hurting. I need somebody to pray with me, and we did. 
gosh, I wish we could do that again. That was the mini sermon within the other mini sermon. That was a rabbit. It was a good one, though. The next one. The new covenant depends upon Jesus fulfilling the law, not us. And he did. He became sin, and he died in our place. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is the moment that he became us. He became me. He became you. That's the moment that God has to reject sin and punish it. And he did it in Christ so that we don't have to be punished. So that we don't have to die in our sin. So that we don't have to be eternally separated from him. And he offered this gift and sometimes we misunderstand what it is. Let's look at the second piece of this. Because of that, then, the resurrection has given us a new power. It is not the power to make all these proclamations that are being made today and all these pronouncements and all these prophecies that in the Old Testament we would just kill them when they were not fulfilled. We're not quite that aggressive. This power is not, and the verb's not go. Let me mess with you for a second. The verb is not go. That's a participle. It says, as we are going through life belonging to Christ, we are to share the love of God. That's teaching the nations. And when they respond to the love of God and accept Christ, the last two pieces of the Great Commission are for saved people only. We are to baptize them into the name of Christ, and the preposition's important there because it's not so much, the, that's, the symbol, that's symbolic of what has spiritually happened. When people come to Christ, they are baptized into the body of Christ and stand down in Creole when the ta, Tara Hamada, did I almost get it back? I can't roll my R, so. Tarahumada, Indians, they came to Christ, and then, and then they did something remarkable. A bunch of them showed up at church the next Sunday and said, now what? I bet you that church went into a frenzy trying to figure this one out. Because he didn't expect it. And then this year, this, they, they, they make, they're extremely introverted people. And they told Passion Play Ministries, this year, we will do the entire play by ourselves. We will do all the main parts, all the pieces. We will present to our own people. Nobody saw that one coming. That's authority over the nations. That's Mauricio telling me, do you know who Hondurans are? They're the children of... Uh, the raped uh, Mayans by the Spaniards. That's who we are. And then he stopped and he looked at me and he said, what we have found is Jesus is the redeemer of nations, families, and individuals. That's where Venezuela is trying to get. They either go the way of the cross or they go the way of Chavez and Maduro. They already know the outcome. Mauricio said, please pray for my family in Elises. They're still in Tegucigalpa. We are at the tipping point of going the same direction as a nation. And I said, what happened? He said, well, here's what happened. If you know how Honduras came to be, Americans basically went down there and did the engineering. That's why we go down and we have a 110 outlet. looks just like ours because we're the ones that put them in and all of the technology. And he said, we basically were modeled after a free society with capitalism and free market and all that stuff. And here's what happened. Our leaders got corrupted. And so now the people have said, because the freedom choice is corrupted, let's try the socialist brand next. You know where that one ends. It's not good. They need Jesus. They need the authority of Jesus over the nation, over the people. We talked about Ricardo Alvarez the other day with Krista and with uh, your Uncle Dick, Linda. And I popped up some pictures and said, we were there when Zelaya was locked up and we met him. I was there the night that he accepted Christ and his wife and some of the military and some of the policemen 
and some of the congressmen, which they made sit in front of us on the floor. How's that for protocol? They came in late. They sat in front of us on the carpet. The new power that is given has the authority over sin because Jesus has paid the price. And when people understand the true gospel message, entire nations will be saved, entire families will be saved, people groups will be saved, individuals will be saved because they entrust their life, their country, their family to the leadership of Jesus. Right now, we're not there, are we, as a nation? We're not there. We're too busy doing other crazy stuff. Second Peter 1 3. <clears throat> By the Spirit is implied here within the context. Because we have Christ who lives in us by his Spirit, we have everything we need to live a life that pleases God. It was given to us by God's own power. That's the word for authority. When we learned that he had invited us to share in his wonderful goodness, we were made the righteousness of God because he became our sin. So here's what we can say about this power. The first bullet, resurrection power within the believer pleases God. Oh, well, I thought it was to go out and name and proclaim and cast out and bind and, you know, I want that, so I'll take it in the name of Jesus, of course. It's not it at all, is it? Resurrection power is ultimately humility and walking humbly. Seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly before your God. That's the essence of the gospel. And when we live in that resurrection power, it pleases God. And even though I'm saved, when I'm not walking in the resurrection power, it's clear. It's not that God disowns me. Okay? Stay with me on this. A broken and contrite heart God loves, and he will work with. A prideful heart God opposes, even in his own children. We're not disowned. It's just we're not listening to him, and he will go forward without us. Any of you have? Well, don't tell me. You have, we all have kids like that, right? You tell them something, they say, okay, and they go do whatever they want. That's the picture of us when we are not submitted to the will of God because he understands what we need. When we submit to that resurrection power within, we become easier to live with ourselves. Other people, it's easier for them to live with us. God makes us then, we are more teachable. We are more usable. We can grow in our faith. We can understand the ministry of reconciliation he has given us to share with other people. And God is pleased. And at that point, Linda, I finally understand what your uncle says when he says, I wake up in the morning and I just say, Lord, all I want from you today is for you to smile upon me. That's what he's saying. I just want to please you by the resurrection power within me. Second, we are invited by this power to live a life like Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Have you ever done that? Try this test at home. Go to Galatians, and it basically says, the deeds of the flesh are these, and that's a really long list. And then the fruit of the Spirit is this, and it's a fairly short list. And what I've done over and over is if you, che if you do check marks, it's kind of enlightening. I can pretty much check off the entire deeds of the flesh list. I can sort of check off part of the fruit of the spirit list depending on how obedient I'm being. When I'm walking in faith the way I'm supposed to, it almost shifts positions. I wish it would stay there, but I can't say it works that way. Today, even God's children have the ability to say yes to entrusting Jesus today or no. We're not unsaved. We're just being a wild child, that's all. We are invited by this power to live a life like Jesus with purpose, and the purpose is to please God. 
And God's purpose is that we be conformed into the image of his son. That's his intent for us. His purpose is that none be lost, but all come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. His purpose is that the body works together as one under his headship so that the kingdom will be fruitful and fruit will be produced within us. And on and on and on. We could come up with two, three hundred verses very easily that support that idea. Purpose is not how it's being defined out in the church today. I finally found out who I want to be married to. I finally found out where I want to live. I finally found out where I want to work. No, that's not what we're talking about. Those are other separate issues. God's in, he's interested in those things, but that's, that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about purpose. We're not talking about my purposes. We're talking about his purposes for me. That's quite different. Joy and freedom from condemnation. Here's why I like this part in the resurrection. Some of us in this room, we have pet names for ourselves. They are not repeatable among good company. And we use it upon ourselves frequently. And we also carry whips in our back pockets so we can flog ourselves. And, you know, we can beat ourselves down. And on and on and on. And here's what happens. When I choose sin over obedience, you know what the first punishment that becomes real in my life is? I lose love, peace, joy. Heaven forbid if you're around, patience. <laughs> Heaven forbid even more, kindness, etc. Self-control, that's out the window. It's just totally gone. The consequences of not walking in the Spirit is sorrow and pain and guilt and shame and self-condemnation. But I thought God sent His Son not into the world to condemn it, but to save it. That's right. So, I have to stop condemning myself and I have to stop condemning other people and you've got to stop condemning me and God's got it all taken care of. When we go to the cross. Otherwise, it is war. Hope that made sense. The resurrection also has given us a new hope. 1 Peter 1 3. Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he gave us new life by raising Jesus Christ from death. And this fills us with a living hope. I don't need science to figure out if there's life after death. I already know the answer. I already know the outcome. I also know that the average person will, and don't get caught in this, we are being told and have been told most of us our whole life, death is just part of the natural process. Is that what the Bible says? What does the Bible say about that? Death is the last enemy that you will fight before you go home. The fight's on. And for some people, it will take months and years. For others, it will be a very quick accident. For others, they just go in their sleep. However that happens, we fight the final battle with pain and death. But fear not, Jesus says, I've overcome the world and I've conquered death. You will live because I live. That's a living hope. That's not wishful thinking. That's reality. First bullet. We have the assurance. Some of you need to hear this today. We need to be assured that we are loved by God through Christ. And we are, in fact, forgiven, even though most of our lives were little rascals and rats. Right? We just do what we want. And God says, it's okay. No that I have loved you with the eternal love. Know that I chose you from before the foundations of the world. Know that I have loved you with a purpose and intent, with an outcome. Know that this world hates you, but I don't. Know that this world offers false peace, but I offer real peace. Do you know that you know that you know that Jesus loves you and he saved you? Because if you don't know, you're just kind of cringing inside right about now. Well, I hope so. 
gosh, I hope Jesus loves me. I want him to. I want to love him back, but I just can't seem to get my act in order. When do you end the fight of death and pain? When, 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 does, when does this thing end? I, I told this story before. Let me do it again. I've got a good pastor friend on the reservation, and he saw me one day at the gas station. He said, Brother Tom, that old devil's just attacking. My parents are sick, and they're in pain, and this is happening, and that's happening. When is the battle over? I said, when you, when you die. He wasn't quite sure what to do with that answer. Did you expect to not have a battle? Did you expect to not have pain? That's the false gospel out there today, folks. Don't fall for it. Anybody else notice that uh, faith healers tend to die at about the same age of the same stuff as everybody else? That's the clue. It's a big clue. Pay attention to it. Okay? We have the assurance that we have an eternity secured in Jesus. He is the Savior. I'm the saved. He's the Almighty God. I'm the creature. He is able to save me. So, Lord, do it. He is willing to save me. So, let me be willing to surrender and let you do it. That's how that begins to work. Security is not based upon how I feel about it. I had a guy years ago when we were doing prison ministry, and he split the group up because he said, I just don't believe in that eternal security of the believer stuff. And I said, then you don't believe the same Savior I have at all. Because if Jesus is able to save me, he's able to keep me, or else he's not a Savior at all. He's an imposter. And I don't want that kind of Savior that if I do something wrong, he boots me out of the family. I will in no wise cast you out. I will know not never. I love it. It's a triple negative in the Greek. I will know not never, ever forsake you. That's security. I don't know what else to call it. So what's missing here? When we give our life to Christ, here's what we do. We let go. We flop around. He never lets go. What's he waiting for? For me to confess that he's still Lord, he's still in my life, that I am still a sinner, that I still need his grace, and he wants me to latch back on, and now the relationship can move forward. It really is that simple, but it's profound, isn't it? We're almost there. A life in Christ because of the resurrection and the empty tomb is one of serving others. Here's how it works. We can serve each other in our marriage, spouse to spouse. All kinds of ways. It's called uh, love one another. Be patient and tenderhearted. Submitting to each other. But I like doing what I want to do. Serving implies that you relinquish a position in favor of somebody else has nothing to do with qualifications. Surely, some, I was not military, but some of you who were military here, surely you figured out somewhere during your career that people who outranked you shouldn't have been in charge. You had a little bit more smarts than them. But you know what? You still submitted because of the rank. But it doesn't work that way with the Lord. I don't have to wonder if, well, he outranks me, but I don't know if he really understands my life. Believe me, he understands your life. Well, you know, he outranks me, and i got to submit just because of who he is. No, you submit because you choose to. Let me give a verse that I used almost 20 years ago in a very heated meeting in this church. And it was an attempt to reconcile. I said, unfortunately, what we have to do today is look at a Bible verse. It says, obey those who have the authority over you. And I said, let me explain what that means. Obey is first off an imperative. It's command. It's in a reflexive voice, so it means me, myself. And it gives me a choice. Here's what it says. If we choose to submit 
to spiritual authority around us, that's how God wants it. But when I rear, rear you know, we, we had a little bit of fur raising this last week from here, here and there. You just kind of pet it down a little bit and go on about your business. When we learn to submit in that way, that's the kind of serving that the Lord's talking about. It's giving of ourself. I, I, met, I met an individual I've been around for about four years now, and it's the first time that person has been on my radar, and it's the first time I saw how broken that person is, how isolated, how lonely that person is, and how he tries so hard to fit in and gets rejected over and over and over again. And I won't reject him anymore. We're going to somehow figure out a friendship. Serving other people. All of you that helped this last week, you gave up time, you gave up everything. We got sick doing it. That's a good kind of sickness. People ask, are you tired? Yeah, it's a good kind of tired. You know why we're tired? You know why we're doing this? Because we love it. It's a gift. We love to serve. It's hard. I was laughing the other night and said, okay, we're 20 years into this, and some of you guys still don't know if you're going to work, it's a good thing to bring tools. We have five drill guns and one bit. What's wrong with this picture? We'll figure it out. I had to submit and loan out my bit <laughs> and, and wait. This would be a good time to drink some water or something. You have been given the privilege for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Now, that verse may sound out of place. Suffering and servanthood go hand in hand. Why? Because suffering includes that some of you went without meals, some of you went without sleep, you overworked yourself, you fought against sickness and illness. Every time we turn around, God is doing something, and it takes stuff to do that. It doesn't just happen. We don't say, God bless Venezuela. We sent them the resources they needed so that they could do the job done. They could get that job done. That's, that's serving other people. Serving is giving. Serving is obeying. Serving is putting yourself second. It's hard to do when you have uh, helped give birth to something and you see people running it off the cliff. Gosh, it's hard to... I was asked the other night, are you still putting yourself in timeout? I said, yeah, but they're really small now. Every now and then, I just walk off. I did that the other night, and I ran in. I just, I goofed, and I almost created a problem, and I realized, you, you dummy, you know better than this. Just go. They don't need your help. Serving is not interfering. Serving is submitting. We weren't trying to ditch you, Charles. I just, you know, these guys got to figure it out. But when I'm saying, he's coming, he's coming, Jesus is coming, I'm not talking about in Jerusalem. I'm, he's getting ready to walk through those curtains. You better pull them. He's coming soon. <laughs> and it, you, you got to approach it that way to make that, that serve. You know, those, those two guys stood in the back for two hours, for eight nights, doing this. You can't go. You can't leave. If you do, some crazy Romans will come charging through the curtain when you least expect it. If you get talking, here they come, and old Jackie's flying. I mean, they almost throw him through the curtains every night. That's an important job. Wayne sat back there, and you know what he did? One of the most important jobs in the play. He changed batteries in all of the headsets and made sure they got put on correctly and everybody had the right mic. And I told him, I said, if I could show you pictures of what has been in the past, that would be chaos. You, this would be order. And he sat there every night for three plus hours, 24 hours, he sat there. Changing batteries, changing stuff out. That's serving. That's a privilege. That, that's something we should want to do. It is a privilege. Serving Christ is a privilege. That next slide. 
provided through the resurrection. So for some of you who brought food and food and food and food, thanks. Those who brought water, we needed it. Those who brought a word of encouragement. CJ had some of the disciples and they do drive-by prayers, okay? A drive-by prayer is where they get, they huddle around you and you can't leave anyway. We're going to pray for you. Doesn't matter that I have a queue coming up. I probably need the prayer first. Honest. That's serving. That's giving. It is a privilege provided through the resurrection to serve God by serving each other, by serving our community, by serving the world wherever he gives us opportunity. I can't say it enough. I told Victor the other. You know how much it will cost them to do Passion Play in Egypt the first time in Minya? 5.5 million people. Anybody know what it cost here? Oh, we're not educating you. Give us a number, Stan. What does it cost here on average? Twelve to 15000 a year. How much did it cost for Venezuela? I realize we have a little more overhead coming, but the production itself. It's under 10. You know what Victor told me for Egypt? We can do it for under 7. And we do not, we, we can't have a venue that small. He said, we have to have something for 20 plus thousand people or more, or they won't even pay attention to us. And we can do all of that, everything, for under $7,000. That's bang for the buck. We can be a part of that. We can be a part of that. The last piece is this. Serving Christ, then, includes suffering that comes with dying to self. Every now and then, we've got to shuffle money. We've got to shuffle time. We've got to shuffle priorities. Somehow, I'm glad my daughter figured that out with Hunter, and he showed up back there. And he started working props and stuff for a couple nights. He loved it. I told Danny he signed a 20-year contract, so just dig in, okay? The rest are coming up. It, it costs. It costs time. It costs finances. It costs effort. It costs submitting to each other. It costs even though you're right. Just let go of it and let it go that direction. That's, to me, one of the harder ones to do. So, what does the resurrection mean to you? If you have the living Christ in you, and you have understood that brokenness and contriteness that has brought you into personal relationship with him, then everything you heard here today made sense. And yet, how are we doing in that department? Here's what I find. When God wants to do something big, it's usually the most inconvenient time for me. It's usually when I have the least resources, of time, of money, of willpower, of all of that. And he says, well, that's kind of the point. Because I have to do it through you. My power has to do it through you, not you. Does that make sense? So when God asks us to give, he's not just, he's not just messing with us, okay? He's not, uh, it, it just it disturbs me when I hear Christians say, well, I go to a church and every week they ask for money. Well, if you'd give money, they wouldn't have to ask for it. That's number one. Number two, a buck doesn't do it. Try paying your bills that way. Okay? It costs. But you know what? If $7,000 can reach 50,000 people, do the math. If 10,000 can reach 1,127 decisions for Christ in a week, put the dollar, figure it out. It really, truly is nothing. It honestly is nothing. Even though this season has passed, you can still be a sponsor to PPMI International. We can plant seed money for Egypt. Figure it out. I'm not asking you for anything. I'm saying we got a privilege and an opportunity here. Think about it. Work through it. I think we'll be surprised what God will continue to do with us, through us, in us. My hope is that all of our partner churches here in town will understand self-control. And when I'm not, 
get out of the way. It's danger coming. You too, right? Is that not us? Let's pray. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> You mean that little kid that we saw grow up? Good stuff. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the life you give to us, for the joy you give to us, for the privileges and opportunities you give to us. Help us to entrust, relinquish our own authority and purpose and agenda to you and entrust you to have a different purpose, a higher purpose, a higher calling. Father, help us to understand what we've heard here today. Help us to share it with those who need to hear. Help us to not, again, just water down the gospel message of just love Jesus and all is good until brokenness comes. There can be no rebirth. John the Baptist was clear, repent and believe. You are clear. Repent and believe. Scripture is clear. Repent and believe. Repent, we understand, Lord, is not stopping being bad and starting being good. It's a change of mind. It's a change of worldview. You are God. We are not. You are creator. We are the creature. You are almighty. We are not. The right thing for us to do is to shout out within our heart and soul, Hosanna, God, please, Save us now. And it's through the rec resurrection that we can find the answer to that prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to do a song, but I, I really want to encourage you again. Anytime we're here, you know invitation time is a little different here. I guess i got to express it this way. I hope when you walk in the door, the invitation is there to respond and grow and submit to Christ. The whole thing. It's not just a decision time. Stick around and pray. Find somebody to pray with. Find somebody to share your life with. Get to know a new face in here. Somebody that you see all the time and you don't know their name. You might even see them in Safeway sometimes. So it's good to, you know, learn these things. And on and on. Uh, do that and make the most of the time that we have here, okay? God bless you. One more time, guys. Stand with us this morning. Sing that song we sang last here this morning because he lives. The end of it, the last verse, the chorus. And then one day, and then one day, I'll cross that river.